inside of here again today and I wanted to visit with you these rule changes basically put forward by the SEC that modernize the definition of unaccredited investor. And I wanted to look at this with you because just a couple weeks ago, I talked about the Link2 platform, which allows you to invest in companies such as Ripple, Coinbase, Robinhood, the Link2 platform itself, and so on um, before they IPO, which is a great thing to be able to get in on because um, that's kind of like getting in on a, uh, a crypto project before it participates in an ICO, for instance, just to try to put it in crypto terms. But anyway, let's look at what it says. So for the first time, individuals will be permitted to participate in our private capital markets, not only based on their income or net worth, but also based on established, established clear measures of financial sophistication. What they really mean is um, if you work as a financial professional, whether it be a, a registered broker, an investment advisor, uh, a private equity sales representative, or you know a couple other things in more detail I'll examine with you. So it says, in conjunction with the adoption of the amendments, the commission designated by order, holders in good standing of the Series 7, Series 65, and Series 82 licenses as qualifying natural persons. So, <clears throat> I don't think you have to hold all of these. Maybe you do. Um, but so each license in order, the Series 7, it just makes you a registered broker, securities broker. So that means anything that is a security, you're authorized to make sales of. You can't, um, you can't make investment recommendations unless you have that Series 65. So that one allows you to be an investment advisor. You have to have the two combined to be an investment advisor or a financial advisor. And the Series 82 is just for private equity, uh, to be a private equity broker, I believe. So maybe you do have to have them all. That's what I'm trying to find in clarification. I know you can't have the, uh, the 65 without the Series 7, I believe. You can take it, um, but to actually work in any kind of um, pro professional fields, um, they each have their own requirements. So it gets pretty specific. And this all comes down to being registered under FINRA. And uh, so FINRA is basically the governing body of the SEC. The SEC makes the rules, FINRA enforces them, uh, just to kind of clarify that. All right, so it also says, with respect to investments in a private fund, any natural person who is a knowledgeable employee of the fund may also be a, an accredited investor. So if you work at a private equity fund, investment fund, something like that, um, and you are, active in their um, you know, daily decisions or, or stuff like that, then you would probably qualify as well. Um, they're going to clarify these definitions later on, though, I would assume. All right, so it also says that they clarify that LLC com uh, LLCs with $5 million in assets may be accredited investors and that uh, SEC and state registered investment advisors count as well, which you would think that they already should count, right? If you're advising people on their investments, you would think that you should be allowed to participate in private equity, not just be rich. Um, but let's be real. The rule was you used to have to just be rich. Now you can be rich or educated in finance. Um, that's kind of what all that they changed. <laughs> the last one was they add the term spousal equivalent to the accredited investor definition so that spousal equivalents may pool their finances for the purposes of qualifying as accredited investors. All right. So what are these exams? I wanted to um, kind of explain a little more in detail how they work, um, how to get them, and so on. So the first one is called the Securities Industry Essentials Exam, the SIE, as it's better known. Um, this one is basically your entry point to get into the industry at all. Um, so you have to pass this to be able to get um, any of the other exams, I, I believe. So the reason I'm uncertain is because when I took the Series 7, they didn't have this. Um, I was actually like the last class to go through um, to do the whole Series 7 at once. And at that time, the Series 7 was actually a six hour long exam. Now they've reduced it to three hours and 45 minutes. I think they've tapered back the, the difficulty of the questions some as well. And um, undoubtedly, at least in my opinion, it's easier how it's structured now because it's a two part test essentially. Uh, it's always easier to take um, 
you know, 75 entry questions and then the next test and just basically do it all at once. And that's how it used to work. But anyway, you take the SIE, then once you pass that, you can take the Series 7. Um, and so now the Series 7 is 125 questions, 3 hours and 45 minutes with a passing score of 72. And a core requisite of the SIE, as mentioned. All right. And that one allows you to just be, like I said, a general securities representative. So, all right, next, the Series 65. This is the Uniform Investment Advisor exam. Uh, this one has 130 questions, and it is three hours long with a required passing score of 94 out of 130, which I think is also like 72, 73, something like that. They're all right there in that ballpark. ballpark. Uh, <clears throat> so... Up to this point, just a brief summary. I believe they might have changed it again. I don't know. It seems like they change it back and forth all the time. But I think you can take the Series 65 without having a uh, basically a, an entity to hang your license with. So in order to take the Series 7, you have to be with a registered firm to even take the exam. They have to basically be your sponsor in order to take the exam. The 65, I know it, you didn't used to need a sponsor because I took it with, without a sponsor. Um, so, um, but anyway. Yep, next one. So, Series 82, as mentioned, that one's private securities offerings representative. So, basically, the guy that's able to go out there and... Um, so, look, they're allowed to seek business for the broker-dealer, which would be that private equity firm. You can open accounts. Uh acquire financial profile, investment objectives, uh, make recommendations. Um, so th these are what the questions are based on, but that's obviously your major job functions. So that's about that, kind of briefly summarizing all of these. Series seven is basically the core of being in the financial services industry as a registered representative. 65 is when you're getting onto that more advanced level when you wanna be an investment advisor and legally authorized to um, help assess individuals goals and needs and understand where they are financially before you make any recommendations for them so that's how a real financial advisor works they aren't allowed to just sit down with you and oh yeah you should buy this that that's what those brokers can do so if uh <laughs> if someone's working at charles schwab or fidelity um and they don't have that investment advisor tag um they're, they're going to be more compelled to want to sell you things other than just try to assess your actual needs and goals. But investment advisors have to do that. Um, so it's always on an individual basis. So if anybody's making um, you know actual recommendations for you as an individual and they haven't um, taken the appropriate information down for your financial situation, um, then they can kind of be in violation of that. So that's why you get all these crypto youtubers that are like oh i'm not a financial advisor this is not a financial this is not financial advice um but really i don't think anyone's actually expecting that so uh but anyway <laughs> lastly i want to show you this thing called broker check um and just so you know anybody and everybody who's an actual financial professional has to have some of these licenses in some form with whatever they're doing the financial services in industry is heavily regulated. Um, it's very hard to get into it and also very hard to navigate through it once you're in. There's a lot of, you're <laughs> extremely limited in what you're allowed to do compared to what you could have been able to do. And that's because of things like uh, Wolf of Wall Street, for instance. So you had all those guys taking advantage of people just selling them whatever it is you know pump and dumps left and right and because of that they i in my opinion they over regulated the industry makes it very hard for investment advisors to navigate and be able to give people sound advice um, because basically the advice that you're allowed to give is very limited in my personal opinion uh, that's another story but i wanted to show you a clear example since everybody probably knows who peter schiff is uh, you can come right here and search for all of Peter Schiff's history. You can see where, where he's ever been registered, if he's ever had any complaints filed against him, 
um, how many licenses he has, what exams he's passed. Um, basically, his entire career history, uh, you can go here and actually look up because he has to be registered and this has to be public information. So, as you can see, he started at Lehman Brothers, so on and so forth. Um, now he's registered with both the Alliance Global and I guess that's it, at least here in the US. Um, I think Euro Pacific Capital is registered somewhere else because that's his firm. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not too certain on what firms he actually owns. But anyway, you can see where he's at presently registered, and that's AGP. So you can also come down here and see complaints that have been filed against him. So right now, he has an ongoing, a pending customer dispute that has been going since April 8th of 2019. Let's see what they're talking about. So the allegation is um, so somebody's claiming that he has he has offered unsuitable investments um, along with misrepresentation misrepre and omission to disclose material risks of those investments and failure to supervise. Damage amount requested. 450,000. The broker comment, he said, I had no personal contact with this individual during the time she was a client and her overall account outperformed the S&P during the years it was active. The firm is rigorous, rigorously defending itself against this claim, which the firm expects to be rejected by the arbitrators. All right, so we'll see what comes out of that. Um, so he says it said client outperformed the S&P 500 and that they need to stop complaining, basically. Um, I wonder if they bought gold. <laughs> oh, maybe they bought the gold fund and they saw the S&P going up and then now gold is exceeding the S&P because, I don't know, whatever. I have no idea. So I'm just basically speculating. All right, so there you have it. That's broker check. Um, anybody who's ever claiming to be a financial advisor that you talk to, uh, you can go here and check their personal information, see the history, see what all tests they pass, where they're licensed, and so on. Um, so just to clarify before I wrap this video up, as I've mentioned before, I used to be a financial advisor. I'm not anymore. So this is not financial advice. This is just obviously, you know, not, none of my channel is financial advice. I'm just trying to help people understand the crypto space as a whole. Um, but yeah, when it comes to these exams, now you have another basically opportunity to become an accredited investor. Um, I'm actually excited about that myself because I'm going to explore how to get some shares of, uh, probably Ripple, Robinhood and Coinbase. So, but there you have it. Now, you know, there's another way, um, as always, I hope that was informative. Um, please like, and subscribe, share with your friends and family. Stay tuned for the next one. What is a cashless society? What does it actually mean in a literal or high level sense? Money will become like these relics of a different age and will only be found in places like this. In other words, hard cash will disappear. It will become electronic transferred by things like these. Then Tracy is in Beijing to show us what a nearly cashless society actually looks like. Then, good morning. Mobile payment transactions in China reached a cumulative total of 277.4 trillion RMB in 2018, ranking number one in the world, according to the recently released statistical report on internet development in China. As of June 2019, online payment users in the country reached 633 million. The cashless society is now approaching. When's the last time you paid with cash? Well, chances are cash has taken a back seat to the plastic in your wallet and smartphone pay apps. Denver 7's Ryan Luby explains the digital pay revolution and why not everyone is on board. The cashless society, the cashless society, the cashless society. The cashless society is now approaching. The cashless society. <laughs>